Well, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour, and uh, welcome to the living room. Uh, we're just going to have a little bit of family time this morning during our Equipping Hour, and uh, I'm going to interview Chris and Jill uh, as an opportunity for you to get to know them a little bit um, and uh, really to have some uh, window into who they are, uh, what makes them tick, and um, even... Uh, we'll see some of the, the benefits of God's grace in their lives that we get to benefit from as a church. And um, hopefully, uh, it will be a, a window in for you to build relationships and uh, ask them lots more questions after this hour is done. So uh, you have permission to grill them <laughs> ad nauseum, at length, ad infinitum. Okay. So uh, let me just start by asking you... Um, how did you, Chris, come to know the Lord? Like many uh, people who were raised in a, in a home that um, spoke about Jesus and that read the Bible and that went to a Bible-believing church, I, I knew a lot of facts about the Bible just growing up. Memorized a lot of verses. Um, I, I remember my parents... Um, helping just it, it encourage things in church that I didn't enjoy as a young person, um, you know, just needing to go, needing to be diligent. And I, I benefited a lot from that. And the church that I went to loved the word of God. And so I, I at least got from that um, just a really good example of, of holding the authority of, the, of Scripture high. You know, when they had questions, they would turn to Scripture. When they opened the, the Bible, they re, it was reverenced. And so I, I love that. Um, however, I continued to grow as a little legalist. <laughs> and so I didn't know Christ until much later. And um, it took some crises in my life and in our family and some things like that to cause me to have need and I think see my need for a savior and, and, and just how weak and how faulty I was. It started with all the worrying about all the hypocrites around me, um, all the other legalists around me, and I was so sensitive to that until um, one day I, ju I just kind of broke. And I was, I was young, I was probably 12, and just had some really difficult things that were going on in my head and my heart. And um, so I opened scripture um, after wanting to kind of ditch it because I saw the, the, the hypocrites out there and I didn't want to be like them. So I'm going to ditch God that lasted for a whole like three months. And I was just, I was a puddle on the floor. And so needed him. I really needed him. And I began to see my own sin and frailty pretty, pretty huge. And when I opened scripture, I started in the gospels and I started reading through and uh, just pretty much not knowing what I was looking for. Um, but I, I ran across some verses that I had memorized strictly to get points um, as a young child to beat everybody else on the number of points you get for memorizing verses. And it was Jesus wept and of all the things. And I thought, I don't know Jesus. Like, this is not the personality of the, of the God and of the Savior that I, 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 I preach. I, I thought he was a, a taskmaster and a, and a distant, holier-than-thou type. And this is the opposite. This is someone broken because the people around him were, were hurting. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus, but he, he wept because of the people that were hurting around him. And I was like, he gets me, you know. And it's so funny, that was a billboard about that, and that's not at all what that means. But anyway, in that crisis, all these facts that my parents and, and people have invested in me at church and other people that have said um, seemed very foreign to me. Uh, and, and it took some time for me to connect those truths to the Jesus I was reading about and the need that I felt. And that was the gospel finally, like um, making sense in the Lord, enlightening my heart to put great meaning to facts that were different uh, than the way I saw it before. And then from there, I just had a, a passion for the gospel and for, for my Savior, for Jesus, that just was um, really obvious, I think, to people that knew me. Um, still had to deal with sin and was thankful that I had a Savior. Uh, evangelized a lot. My mom actually put me back into a public school just because she was like, you need to be a light and you need to evangelize and the Lord used that. Um, so that's, that's how I went from legalist and knowing all the answers, but being completely lost to the Lord humbling me and, and giving me an opportunity to, um, see the purpose of the gospel and my need for a savior. Thanks Chris. Yeah. God's amazing grace. And, uh, how, how different would people have seen sort of your external life before and after? 
You know, it's funny. Um, I, I used to think they wouldn't have seen anything, but now that I'm older and I look backward and I see <laughs> and I know more about my salvation and I see the patterns that I was living in and I see the patterns that our, our home uh, kind of exemplified and, and the things that I struggled with, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was evident because while I was doing all the right things before, my heart was far from the Lord and my love for others was not, was not what it should be. And then there was a joy uh, and I don't know, I mean, I still didn't enjoy math and I didn't enjoy, you know, things I struggled with in school and, and people that, you know, but I had a, I had a compassion and a, and a love that was different. And so I, I would like to know, you know, people that knew both ends of that to see if they saw a difference because my, the things I did during the week didn't really change, but my attitude did. And, um, my admission of sin, uh, my need for a savior to, to forgive and then to restore me because of the brokenness that my sin brings, that was more palpable in in the things I did on a daily basis as a 12-year-old, as a 13, 14, 15-year-old, which makes a big difference. Jill, what about you? How did you come to know Christ? Yeah, I actually grew up in a really loving home, uh, but we did not talk about God, and we did not read our Bibles, and we sometimes went to church, but we didn't go very often, and maybe not together. And... But um, we, I was always really curious about God, and I would ask my parents questions, and they didn't know how to answer my questions. And, but God was really kind, because in high school, junior high and high school, I had a lot of Christian friends, and they were joyful about following Christ, and they loved God's word. And I was involved in music in high school, in a couple of different choirs, and there was this all-city kind of music event. And after that event, we all ended up at Chris Trent's house. And Chris didn't go to my school, and I didn't know him, but there were a bunch of music kids sitting around, and we were all um, just talking about different things, and Chris was like, well, he was an evangelist, right? So he's like, well, I'm gonna share the gospel. And so he shared the gospel, and he talked about his confidence that he was going to heaven, and um, I just thought, how do you know that? How do you know that you're going to heaven? And he said, well, I know the life and death of Christ because I read my Bible. It's in scripture. And I said, where is it in scripture? How do you know? And he said, it's all over, but especially in Romans. And uh, we, I didn't know if I'd ever see Chris Tran again, um, but I went home and I found a Bible and I read the book of Romans and I saw my sin in Romans 6 and 7. Um, I was a slave to it. I identified that. I knew that I was <clears throat> not doing what I should do, and I was, um, I was doing things that I shouldn't do. And, um, and then I read Romans 8, and I saw the mercy of God, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I started to believe it, and I started to read um, read scripture and go to church with friends. And I <clears throat> thought everyone would be just as excited about that as I was. And um, it turned out that my family wasn't very excited about that. And it caused a rift. And that was a really difficult time. Um, immediately, I had to choose whether I was going to follow Jesus and read his word and obey him, or if I was going to please my parents. And um, that was, that was challenging and hard, um, but God rescues and redeems, and he was just really kind. I actually um, did see Chris Trent again, and uh, his, <laughs> his family was really, uh, really formative in my, um, in my spiritual growth in the beginning. And fast forward to now, um, my entire family uh, claims Christ and walks with the Lord. We prayed, yeah, my parents, we prayed for a long, long time. And they were baptized and they go to a sweet little church in Nebraska. And um, so that's kind of the short story. Jill, you said something really fascinating in there. Yeah. You saw Chris Drent again. <laughs> Tell us about that. Okay, what happened next? <laughs> we do want both sides of the story. Um. Yeah, so we actually met in high school. I was a senior, she was a junior, and um, we actually went to different schools, as she mentioned, but we were both in a select music choir, actually in a couple of select music choirs. These are very, both of these high schools, for some reason, had excellent music programs, and so they would have these competing groups that would 
travel around into these regional competitions. And it just happened to be that that year, uh, there were these two schools that tended to take first and second pretty much everywhere we went. So that was her school and my school. And we tended, we, we got to hear each other do their acts actually over and over and over. But it was great because they were excellent. And um, uh, we kind of saw each other uh, from afar. And um, so we had some mutual friends in these group too that really wanted to set us up. And I was like, no, nah, you don't understand. I don't, I don't date. I don't date, you know? <laughs> and they didn't understand that, you know, but, but one of them who was a Mormon actually understood my religion. We had long religious, I mean, I'm evangelizing this guy. And so he's like, oh, I get it. You're, you're a Jesus lover and you want a Jesus lover and you should meet this girl. It's like, no, nah, honestly. And fast forward, they, they set us up because we all went in a, in a big group thing. Right. And then basically they stood us up. And so here I am. And, and, uh, but that group thing that she was talking about over, over at our house, I, I finally just said, all right, I'm just, this is how I do this. I'm just going to share the gospel, and most people run away. Well, she was interested in what I was saying, and I thought, mm, maybe she's doing this just to, like, impress me. I'm not into that either, so, mm, you know. Um, but ultimately, she later came back, and I was like, hey, I was talking to her, and she's like, by the way, I read Romans. And I was like, yeah, okay. Um, Romans what? And she's like, no, no, all are Romans. And I'm like, first of all, you don't understand the Bible culture. It's like, you should really dig into two or three verses. No, I, d I didn't say that. <laughs> she read all of Romans. I was like, well, did it make sense? And she's like, well, well, yeah. And I was like, okay, like what? And she started spouting off all this great gospel truth. Clearly, the Lord had done something. And she was excited about it. I was, under, I was catching some of the drift of the rift that was in her family. And, and so all of that to say, I was interested and she was not in my Christian circles and so everybody was kind of like do you do not want to hang out with people who are not part of your church and who are not part of your Christian circles and so there was some kind of wonder about that but ultimately uh, we started spending more time we talked a lot about the Lord and, and got to grow in that and um, um, so we we started dating and um, she, st she was coming to church with me and we got to know each other and we did continue to do music. I graduated, went to college away to a Christian college. She was still in school and of course she's thinking I'm never going to see him again. He's going to go see all these you know, godly women at this Christian college and I left and just thought about her all the time and, and ended up coming back and marrying her and so in college uh, we got married. Anything to add to that, Jill? Mm. I like him. He's pretty great. Okay, he has well, a great voice. So we, we actually met singing. He was yeah. singing some, um, uh, yeah. some Harry Connick Jr. music in the foyer. I thought he was pretty great. Did he propose in song? He did not. Okay, how no, did but he did down? sing at our wedding. You sang at your own wedding? Yeah, that was tough. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I still want to know, how did he propose? Mm, we, so Chris loves, um, he loves the trees and hiking, and we were, we were really, we were really young, mm. and um, still in, I think, I think I had finished one year of college, you came back, and um, things were still kind of hard at, in both of our homes, our families were struggling, and um, he, we went on a big long um, day in the woods hiking. I mean, in the woods in Nebraska, and um, and he, we had a picnic, and he asked me to marry him. And I said yes. So. Okay, Jill, tell us about your family. Where are they? What are they doing? Mm, my like my kids' family. <clears throat> yes, we. Uh, uh, we have a great family. We love each other and we have a lot of fun together. We um, have always loved um, quoting movies and reading books together and going on trips. And um, we used to eat bagels together when they were little and now we drink coffee together and talk about the Lord and what he's doing in our lives. Um, our oldest is Bria. And she is creative and fun and kind of sparkly. And she um, just sees the world through relationships. Everything for her is people. She actually went to college and got her degree in biblical counseling because she wanted to help people. And then uh, after college, she 
uh, met Jonathan, and they uh, got married about a year and a half ago, so we have a son-in-law, and he loves hiking and reading biographies, and he is steady to Bria's creative energy, so they're very good for each other. Um, they're in Kansas City. They um, love and serve Mission Road Bible Church in Kansas City. We'll probably talk more about that church in a little bit. Um, our son Morgan is 22, and he is—he just graduated from Boys College um, last May, and he—he um, he did that in three years. And he is a TES student in Kansas City um, at Mission Road, and he is our game master. He's always coming up with a new game to get people talking to each other. He's hilarious. Um, he's also super intentional with relationships. He is—he um, just wants to. Uh, point people to Christ all the time. Um, he wants to be an overseas missionary and uh, met a girl named Ireland and she um, she said she would go with him to the overseas mission some, somewhere, whatever the Lord has planned for them, and they are engaged and getting married, Lord willing, in December. And Cooper is our youngest and he came with us on this Air, Arizona adventure. And he is super brave, and um, we're just really encouraged by his testimony of God's goodness in his life. Um, and he uh, is also creative. He writes short stories and loves music. So Chris um, discipled our kids to love God's word and also to um, love music. So we have a whole band. Our daughter plays uh, piano and sings, and our son Morgan plays bass, guitar. He's, he's really good. And um, our son Cooper is a drummer. And then Jonathan married into this family, this musical family, and um, so he plugged himself into the slides. So he runs slides now. Um, <laughs> So we have, we have the full band, and we're just really blessed. All of our kids um, are walking with the Lord, and that's really humbling and really sweet, and God's just really kind. And they're all going to come here and visit you, and we'll have yes. the Von Drent family we, singers. I hope so. Some of my favorite moments are when my whole family is on stage on Sunday morning and um, worshiping the Lord. Did so, you say whole family? Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> she uh, she usually sits out there and is the greatest cheerleader we have. Uh, just encourage and she smiles. And if anybody in the worship team and the music team ever looks out and sees her, look. If you need someone to smile at you, she's she's beaming, and it's it's a blessing. Everybody in the choir back at Mission Road needs her, and in the, in the she, they look at her and they say, "You're encouraging when when we have to sing." Yeah. Now Chris has already told us the choir is this. That's right. That's right. So does that. Technically, she's in the choir out there. You're there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Chris, tell us about your musical career. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. So I've, I grew up, um, my dad taught me how to play guitar when I was young, and then some other people helped me learn how to play guitar, and um, one of those is Scott Maxwell. That was much later. And so I've had people that were, uh, and then in, in um High school in particular, uh, part of the reason my mom put me, I was homeschooled for a while, and so my mom put me back in, in, in high school because there was a great music program too, and so I got involved in, in choir, learned a lot vocally uh, from some great people, and had a lot of good experience there, and then in college, again, touring select choir, some things like that, and so always been a vocal guy, but always played guitar young, and then just loved picking up whatever instruments I could try to figure out, so my, my family remembers a lot of crazy noises coming from my room of learning how to play reed instruments like saxophones and, you know, playing harmonica and weird trump trombone, just weird things. Um, so love that. But in college, after getting married, um, there was a group, a Christian vocal group. This is, I'm going to date myself, but back when boy uh, vocal bands were a big deal. So you had like Boys to Men and, and 90 Degrees. I mean, all these, like, you know, um, in sync. Um, those were a big deal. Um, you guys know Pentatonix, right? So there's a group like Pentatonix, if you've heard of those guys, acapella, vocal, and but they were a Christian band that did some incredible arrangements of hymns and then some modern things. And um, we would go see them whenever we could. And a couple of them went to the church that I went to. And one time, one of them called me up and said, hey, uh, we want to go full-time touring. And... Um, one of the guys that's in our group, Brian, he's taken a pastoral position and can't travel. So 
wondered if you would join us and tour with us full time. And I'm like, whoa, I'm in school, I'm married. <sighs> Let me pray about it. So about a minute and a half later, I called him back and I was like, yes, you know, no, my, my wife and I talked about it for quite some time and um, quite a sacrifice to do it, but got to tour with them um, full time on the road, went all over the place. And um, that was great when she could come with me, but then we had our first child and I knew immediately I, I cannot be a husband and a father and be on the road. Um, and so I, I, I'd resigned and, um, became a cybersecurity expert <laughs> where there were no books or degrees for that at the time. So it was all research and then um, moved to Kansas City to take a job. And um, so since then, my music has been more mu uh, church focused. But even then, like in college and when I was young, I was leading music at church. And so that was a great outlet for that. And um, always been in churches that had good music programs. And so it challenged me and put me with good musicians to learn. And so uh, that was not a step down at all. You know, it was, it was sweet to see the body. And that so okay, take us to next career, next phase of life. <clears throat> yeah, what did you do after the band? You mean okay? So, the short story is, um, I needed to get off the road, and so I became a, a, a consultant for a, an IT, a global consulting firm, and became this cybersecurity guy. And, and like I said, I had to do a lot of research, but once you get good at something, they send you all over the world, and so it's like I was back on the road again. And I'm thinking, man, if I wasn't going to do that for music and for the Lord, then I'm not going to do it for corporate America. And so um, I, I kept trying to stay home, and they would fight me and fight me, and finally they, they, they fired me. Um, and uh, actually, that was a longer story. My, my second my child was born, and I needed to be home, and 9-11 just happened. And they said, you're going to New York because you're a senior and you, you need to go take care of these people. I said, guys, I've got friends in New York. They can't get home. And my wife's about to have a baby and my daughter's sick. I need to be here. And so they basically fired me. And so I said, you know what? This is a good time to be without a job. I'm going to watch my, <laughs> my family. And I started a business right after 9-11, which was hard. Um, but started a business so that I could be at home and, and I could choose how far I would travel, which means not. And there was a lot of business to be had in Kansas City and in the metro area um, for doing cybersecurity consulting. And um, so that's what we did and um, developed a methodology for application security and website security, things like that, and, and use that to bless the people in that area and grew a business for 20 years. And uh, while being close to home so I could be a, a family man and, and uh, disciple my, my kids and then get plugged into the church, be a churchman, learn to teach, learn to lead, learn to elder. And so uh, I thought that was my tent making scheme. You know, the Lord would let me do that a lot more. But small business started to suck me in as things got difficult after COVID. And I just decided, you know what, this is the time where um, I get to uh, ask the Lord to transition me out of business ownership and into full-time ministry, whatever that would be. And so uh, a year ago. I shut down the company and um, enrolled in TES, actually a year and a half ago, and um, started asking the Lord to put me in full-time pastoral ministry somewhere where I could use gifts that he's been developing and yet I could still train. And I had some good conversations with churches about that. So you're in school with your son. How's that? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so Morgan, yeah, he's in Kansas City at the TES campus there. Interestingly, I've never been in class with him at, in Kansas City because he was in college, and so I thought he'd come back and I'd show him the ropes, you know. Mostly the coffee ministry that I started there for the TES guys at 4 a.m. Um, but no, he, he came back and kind of learned it all on his own while I'm here, and so I get to see him on TV, and see, he sees me on the TV in the two different campuses. Uh, but it's sweet. I get to call him. I called him this last week. Hey, how's Hebrew going? <laughs> you know, we're learning Hebrew together. That's pretty cool. Uh, he's a better student than I am. I'm, I'm a little slower than he is. He's fast at this, so uh, but it's sweet to hear him and see him start to lean into those things and talk with him about it and fellowship. On cybersecurity, how vulnerable are we, and should we be terrified? Um, absolutely vulnerable. You should all be terrified, and the Lord is good, and you you've got confidence in Him, so you don't have to worry about anything because uh, even if the end should come, we all know the answer of what happens. Great. Jill, tell us about um, the things that get you excited in terms of family, ministry, church. You can tell us about the things you were doing in Kansas City. Um, what, what just gets you excited about church life? I'm excitable. So a lot of things get me excited. Um, I, do, <clears throat> I do love my family. I, we love our church in Kansas City. Really, really sweet church. Um, 
we love the leaders of that church and um, the teaching and the discipleship that's happening and a bunch of sinners getting together and learning how to be um, learning how to honor the Lord and become more like Christ so that's really sweet um, and then God's just really kind to use us in ministry. Um, it's very humbling and also just a joy. But um, some things that uh, we did, we've done a lot of different things in the church, but um, uh, once a month we met together as elders' wives and just prayed together for our ministry to the women in our church. Um, that was really encouraging. And Chris led a young marrieds group um, so we'd meet with people who are married five years or less. So we got to have Bria and Jonathan in there for a little bit. <clears throat> for, yeah. And um, that was really fun. We just have a heart for young families. Uh, Chris was leading them through how to establish a Christian home with biblical goals. And um, then kind of after that, uh, I started a, a mom's group with... Um, a couple of other elder wives and we met in our homes every week and encouraged young moms to be faithful in the, the daily grind of being a mom. And um, let's see what else. We hosted people um, from our church and from around the world and one-on-one -on -one discipleship relationships. I got to encourage homeschool moms, especially uh, moms who were homeschooling through high school because that can be a little intimidating. And so got to en encourage homeschool moms. So those are some things that I get excited about. Get really excited about spending time with my family. So We also had opportunity, uh, actually at the previous church, to, to uh, lead a college group, and we would do that in our home. We'd, we'd, so we'd have somewhere between 30 to 60 college students come over and they would watch our home and we had younger kids at the time and so they'd watch us parent uh, and it was just funny the the things they would ask um, or the things they would say about life taught us to be parents because we're like oh that's what that looks like when we don't address that in our four-year-old and it becomes a 24 year old and so it was helpful for us in our in our biblical I guess training of, of what godliness looks like in an adult and, and the challenges that come and how to counsel that uh, fueled our how we parented, but then they also got to see us parent, and so they would hang out at our, at our home. If you know anything about college ministry, they come at 6 p.m., and they hang out till 8.30 uh, when you're done, and then they still hang out, and by 1 o'clock, you're still talking and counseling, and that was, that was that. But we got to do it in our home, and our kids got to see that. Our kids got to love the people, and then so a lot of the... the the ministry that we did, we did as a family, and it was um, it was sweet to see our kids get behind that. So then, when we go on on missions trips or whatever, we'd bring our kids, and they were all in, just wanting to do the same thing. It was it was a lot of it was very sweet. And so, just transparently, it's interesting. This is the first time in our life where we're diving into a heavy ministry scenario, and we don't have our whole team with us. We've we've divided and conquered. You know, we've we've sent them out. Actually, they sent us, uh, but. It is sweet to see them do their thing and us do our thing and yet still kind of have the, the solidarity of the purpose that we're doing. And that's part of the ministry that we encourage people in the church to do as well, just to bring that full circle as to what type of ministry. So, Yeah, the they send us is significant. And, uh, you know, Rick Holland is the pastor at Mission Road. Uh, he's no stranger here. Um, and, and he called one day and said, hey, do you need a Chris Drent? And um, that was probably three years ago or more uh, that yeah. kind of started that Yeah, I still had my business. So and it's telling people I'm not available. I'm just, you know, <laughs> looking and Absolutely. so uh, very, very thankful um, just for the way God arranged all of that. And then just to watch the way uh, Mission Road sent you, mm. laid hands on you, commissioned you to, to this Arizona adventure. Um, we're, we're so grateful. Chris, in a moment, I'm gonna ask you about your philosophy of music in the church. But before that, I just wanna ask you about the aesthetic of music <laughs> and the power of music. What do you like about music? What can music do? Yeah, I'm gonna to try to self-edit because I, he knows that this is a hot button and I'll go on and on and on about it. And I don't wanna do that this morning. But um, there's something about music. God created music with a specific, a very unique ability to communicate and express things without words. And when you pair it with words, it's really powerful. But it's, you, you'll notice this, and even people that don't like music, all they say they're not affected by music, 
try watching a movie without a soundtrack. But if you watch a movie with a soundtrack, you'll notice it will communicate suspense, it will communicate sadness, it will communicate joy and elation. And your body, it's funny, your, your emotions, your affections follow. And that's obviously manipulated a lot, I think, in our culture. Uh, but God created it to be used for ministry and for um, effective um, ministry. And, you know, in churches, it's, it's abused a lot, you know, they'll put bad lyrics and really great melody and get stuck in your head. And I remember my kids, my daughter, Bria, she was like born singing and matching pitch and harmonizing. It's just weird. But one day I remember her, her getting a song stuck in her head that I loved until I realized, you know, if we got something stuck in her head with good lyrics, man, that'd be powerful. <laughs> you know, these are yeah, we were in a variety of jazz and, and music I enjoyed, but weren't necessarily spiritually uh, edifying. And I was like, man, if we could pair that together, we really got something, you know. But I, I knew that I was a, a, a music leader already at church. And so growing in that and pairing that together becomes part of the... But there's a, there's a physics, just physics behind what good harmony looks like and, and what, why it sounds good to people who don't even know anything about music. And it tugs at your soul. And so we want to use that well, and um, God uses it well. And if you have noticed how many times in Scripture we're commanded to sing or commanded to lift up the harp and the drums and the cymbals and, and to make much of Christ or make much of God and certainly of Christ in, in that, um, then what a, what a purpose, right? And we as the church have that. Look all the way back to the uh, early church and the church Christians sang look back before that to the people of God early on and they were commanded to sing and they sang with choirs and they sang with loud instruments and uh, to do it well and it was all for the glory of God because they knew that, that there was something about music that would draw it in so here corporately sorry I'm jumping into the philosophy of ministry now <laughs> here um, I, I don't know we could do responsive reading I think, and that, that's a wonderful thing, without music, we, that alone is powerful because it involves all the corporate gathering. But there's something about music that also adds uh, expressions. When, when skillful people, more skilled than I, I'm not a great writer, but when you've got skilled people who can put lyrics to a melody that also gets stuck in your head and that, that you just enjoy singing and your, your, your soul responds to the emotion of the music too, and you put it, it's a powerful thing. And so we, we try to find those expressions and then draw the whole corporate church into that. Um, and so we place a priority on incorporating music in our services because God puts a priority in calling us to sing, um, and the music provides a powerful way for the entire church to participate in expressing these truths together, and if you look at how scripture calls us to do it, we, we do it in worship to God and in ministry to each other. We're, we're singing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs to each other, instructing because the word of God is, we're filled with the word of God, and that's, that's what instruction looks like sometimes. Um, and in ministry to our own souls, you see it in scripture, in, in the Psalms, oh, my soul, why are you downcast with me? Hope in the Lord. Look up at the subscript. That was written for the choir master. That was, that was made to be sung. Uh, even the confessions of David were made to be sung. Why? Because it's supposed to like, get caught here, the truths of, of living reality. We're preaching it to each other. And I got to tell you guys, on mornings when I, I've got a heavy soul and I come to church and there are 300 or more uh, voices singing in unison truth that I know to be true, but I'm just struggling to hold on to right now. It is so encouraging. It, it speaks to my soul. And so what do we want to, when we come together, we minister to each other in that. And you, you are the choir if I'm up here singing and I'm leading or we've got musicians up here, we're just trying to make sure that you all know when the downbeat is and what to sing and what truth we're all focusing on and to unite three, 400 voices together and minds and hearts to all agree on the same truth and sing it in solidarity is something that will give us a charge that is emotionally filled, but it's not emotion driven. It, they follow and our affections are there. And for people that are non-believers, we see this in scripture too, they hear and they're like, whoa, what is that about? And they believe this. And they go out and they're singing it with their lives. Their whole lives are worship. That's how, that's how that fits in. So music is not worship on a Sunday morning. Music is one element of worship. Worship, as you know, in the, in the Christian life is everything. 
in life. And when we sing it, it better be expressing things that we're, we believe in that we need to hear again. And we just do it in a way that gets caught in our minds with a melody that somebody coined. And um, I'm thankful that we have those gifted people that write them and we get to bring them into the church and we keep finding music like that. And we hold on to the old tradition, traditional ones that, that communicate it well too. Okay, we sing these lofty lyrics, truths about God and the aspirations of our own hearts to respond appropriately. And we, are we living up to what we're singing? What, what do you do with that uh, potential integrity problem when we're singing beyond our living? Yeah, I gotta tell you, there are some songs that I am convicted to sing sometimes. And, uh, but this is what we're doing. We're speaking truths to our souls. It should rub against us. I think some of these truths are so, they're articulated so sharply and clearly um, that, that it should rub up against uh, where I'm actually at. And, and I think this is just like why we should preach the gospel to ourselves, preach truth to ourselves. Our hearts will say certain things um, to us that we know aren't true or they're not the full truth. And we need to have uh, biblical articulations of that truth that we can preach to ourselves. And the, and the songs do that to us. So I, I think it's okay when we're singing and we're like, I don't really live up to all that I'm singing. Uh, we, we should, we're preaching truth to our own hearts and to each other to encourage each other and spur one another on to be what we know scripture is calling, God is calling us to be through his revealed word. And so uh, they're useful in that regard and it should convict us at times. And, and in those times, if you ever want to stop singing and just confess to the Lord that you want to be that, but you're not, um, I'm not going to be offended if you guys all stop singing and just respond to the Lord personally for a moment, but come back because this is not personal time of worship. This is corporate. You can do personal, you know, throughout the week. This is where we gather and you are drawn into doing it together. And there's something powerful about that, that the Lord wants for our soul to hear. So we sing it to each other. We preach it to each other and it, and it encourages us and sharpens us. Uh, and that's why we sing really strong truth. What's the different about playing an instrument here? than in other venues. And what are you looking for in an instrumentalist, a musician, uh, guys in the sound booth, technicians? Um, yeah. Yeah, first and foremost, um, one thing, I, uh, nomenclature mat terms matter. And so I, I'm gonna call this music ministry up here, um, but the end result of music ministry is, is meant to draw and to lead the people into worship and worship in spirit and in truth. And so, what we can't have is musicians that are excellent but aren't worshipers. They have to be people that, are, that, that love the Lord and whose lives are marked by grace that is transforming them. Perfection is not the standard at all. Um, but somebody whose lives are marked by, by worshiping the Lord, responding in truth, and, um, and you get to see that transform them progressively. You're seeing sanctification happen. Those people are worshipers. Uh, because of of their pursuit of the Lord and what they're learning of the Lord. And so we need that first and foremost. Uh, truth, someone pursuing truth and, and living in it and being transformed by God's grace can then respond in worship in spirit and truth. And so that's the, that's the first and foremost. And then they need to be excellent in their craft and they need to be able to work on their craft. And nobody who's up here um, is here because they've arrived in spiritual matters or in musical matters. And, and if, you're, if you're not working on, my, myself included, if I'm not practicing and working on that, then um, I probably should be serving in other areas of the church just because um, this is an area where we need to do it with clarity and with precision, not to be impressive, but so that it is leading well and that people know, hey, we build here. Hey, this is where we enter. Um, and if a musician doesn't know that and it throws everything off and it's in discord, then y'all aren't led well and so um, those are kind of the criteria and how we lay that out um, just at a high level when you think about our corporate gathering and all the elements of a Sunday service how does music fit in um, are you thinking about elements beyond the music how do you see the the gathering together yeah so the whole thing is a worship service uh, so this is why I try to avoid calling us the worship team um, or even the music as, hey, I enjoyed the worship, sometimes people will say. And, um, you know, I just, I understand that, that language, but I also want to encourage people to remember, you know, the listening and sitting under God's word, you, you should be worshiping, <laughs> that's worship. Uh, or giving, if you gave today, um, if you're taking the Lord's table, oh, that's worship. And, and so, therefore, 
it is important that we conspire to talk about what a morning's about and what when we bring the word of God and it's going to be taught by someone who has worked long and hard to prepare it well and just surf it up on a silver platter for us. Um, they're going to be worshiping in that. So how do we how do we try to use music as expressions that that prime that um, and and that go along with and respond to and give expression. You and I may not have expression to respond in worship and participate in it verbally. So to prepare a song that allows the 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 expression to to make it easy for people to say, "Wow, that's exactly what I'm thinking." I just didn't know how to articulate it like that. Um, that's what we want to do with the music to fit in with those things. And they don't always have to be the same theme or the same topic. But um, you know what? If we're going to talk about this particular passage, it would be great if we all focused on the glory of the Lord and had an expression of that that's biblical and that our hearts can just sing that before we hear this. Um, worship, music, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say something that probably needs to be dialed back and you can do that for me. We don't, we don't bring music to only introduce the morning. It's not the opening act. It, we don't bring music just to prepare your heart to hear the word taught or just to close a service. W music in itself is worship to worship God and that is the end game. But put together, it really does help us um, usher into thinking right things as we, so that we can be responsive to God's word and give us expression afterwards and send us off well. And so we get to use it in all those manners uh, and just conspire to use it well. Okay, will I dial that back a little bit? You just took us to a 10 on the dial. I'm just <laughs> gonna suggest this one goes to 11. Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> um, how should we prepare? I, I, I totally agree. Music is not the, the perfunctory introductories to the important things going on. Sure. So how do we come prepared for Sunday mornings? How do I, how should I be thinking about uh, Saturday and Sunday morning and family prep in order to, to be here, to gather with God's people and to participate as a worshiper in the various elements? Yeah, you know, and I think in the history of the church, we're at we're in a in a season where we're not well prepared. I think in other cultures and in other seasons of of the church, um, people looked so forward to the corporate gathering um, that they came with hearts well prepared. And when we're not in our culture well shepherded, well taught to do that, we just kind of show up to the next thing and we kind of strap ourselves into the ride and we let the roller coaster go around and we get out and we leave and we hope everybody else did the hard work that our hearts need to do. And so I, I would encourage you, think about this to prepare your own heart. You are the corporate gathering. It's not what's up here. This is just guiding and, and leading and, and the fellowship and, and in the corporate, particularly in the singing, um, nature of that is special. And so prepare your hearts. Um, but I, I will say this, I think sometimes it's important that we need to put distractions aside when we get here. Uh, let, me, let me say what that doesn't mean, though. I don't want anybody to get the impression that when you walk through these doors, you have to ignore the burdens that you're bringing or the cares that you're bringing. This morning was a good one for me. I need to remember that uh, the God that I'm coming to worship doesn't tell me to put my, my, my worries and anxieties aside and ignore them for a moment so I can give him attention, but to bring them to him and particularly to this body so that when you're worshiping, you, you're all there because he's the one that also bears that with you. But if you brought your, your heart and it is full of joy this week and you've been seeing God's goodness and everything, bring it and let it overflow for everybody that needs to be ministered to here. So... Prepare your heart for ministry. Uh, Saturday night, our Rick Holland's admonition to all of us for so long was, look, Sunday morning begins Saturday night. Um, if you are exhausted when you get here in the morning because Saturday night was about other things, uh, how well are you going to be ready to have a joyful heart that's overflowing? Or are you just like hanging on for dear life to keep your eyes open? And, or, or even... Um, uh, just preparing your, your family. Um, I know that Sunday morning can be hard between your door and this door. And just particularly if you've got mus musicians in your family that are here at, you know, 645 and the other one has to like bring the kids. I thank you if that's you. But, um, I would just say Sunday night, talk to your kids. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but how do you prepare, how do you prepare your kids 
how do you prepare your own heart, your, your spouse? How do you encourage them? Think about that on a Saturday night and so that when you go to bed, what you expect is to get up and to worship God with all of your brothers and sisters who are part of the local body. And when you walk through the door, um, are you ready to worship? And some of that's going to be to bear burdens, and some of that's just to rejoice with people. Um, and then when, when you're before the Lord, uh, you're ready. So, yeah, when you're in here talking, um, yeah, ask the Lord to prepare your heart and be thinking about that and um, bring all of you and everything that the Lord has put in your life um, so that you can make that part of your ministry. That's so great, Chris. You know, we, we are just groomed to have this consumer mindset hmm. that we come in for a product and something is done for us. And I'm just going to quote you here. You said, uh, we expect, you said this off the cuff, but this is something to write down. So get out a pen, right. write down what you just said. Yeah. Uh, we expect everyone else to do the hard work our hearts need to be doing. Um, th that, is, that is a fantastic way to summarize the necessary preparation for coming on a Sunday morning. Uh, whether it's sitting under a sermon, the public reading of scripture, the Lord's table, th these aren't uh, ceremonies that are done for entertainment or consumerism. Uh, th this is designed by God for active participation of the mind and the heart. Um, so, it, yeah. it's corporate. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, there are a lot of ways to think about prepping for Sunday mornings. I would love to hear, uh, Jill, what have you done over the years with your own family just in thinking about Sunday's coming? Mm. Yeah, I th think there was a special place on our drive to church that I was like, oh, if I haven't thought about how to care for people when I get to church by that place, I'm in trouble. Um, so we would, um, I mean, practically lay out clothes the night before, um, talk to the kids about what to expect Sunday morning. We still do that with Cooper. I was like, hey, by the way, they're going to interview us Sunday morning. Um, but also just... Um, trying to recall to mind, asking the Lord to help me remember conversations that I'd had the week before so I can follow up and care for souls. And um, a lot of that is just constant prayer, asking the Lord for help to remember because I'm weak-minded and I forget things and I forget conversations. And so um, setting my mind on Christ. Sometimes it's okay to like come in church and sit down and just be quiet before the Lord and um, ask him to draw worship from us um, because I, I'm not going to naturally worship. So ask for his help. So those are some ways, uh, prayer along the way, um, talking to the Lord, asking kids if they're ready to um, ask good questions, if they're ready to listen. Um, if they remember last week's sermon, um, at Mission Road, the kids sit through the whole sermon, the whole service. And so we would talk every Sunday after church at lunch. We would ask them something they remember. Even when they were tiny, they, they could come up with something. Um, usually Rick repeats himself, so he, they would come up with funny things that he repeated. But um, those are just some ways. A lot of prayer, um, it takes work. It takes being intentional. It takes thinking ahead. Um, Sunday night, um, Sunday morning, or Saturday night and Sunday morning, and on the way, if I'm half, halfway to church and I haven't thought about it, then I, I need to draw, fix my attention on Christ and um, just be ready. So those are some things. Chris, on music, uh, musical styles, um, instrumentation, ensembles are very preferential. Um, how do you manage preferences and principles related to serving, leading a corporate gathering? Yeah, so first of all, um, it's a blessing for a church. I, I think there's a trap that can limit us significantly in, in our um, in our worship when we only choose to worship in our own personal style. Um, we, we all delight, don't we, that God is a God who desires worship from every tribe, tongue, nation, and culture. Every. <laughs> and um, we'll receive it. So and you're going to introduce bagpipes on <laughs> Is that what you're saying? And 
but but what but what I find is that my heart sometimes limits my own worship. And I've heard people tell me this. Um, I was one of several worship leaders at an at a, at a, an event, and I had someone come out and say, "Look, I'm so glad you're leading this morning because I don't even go in there if it's not you leading." And they were trying to like like encourage me. Like I don't I don't go in there and worship if that guy's leading because I don't care for his style, and my heart broke, and because I, I just look God's glory is worth be, being <laughs> receiving worship uh, such that you should not put a limitation on I only will worship Him if I get the song I like. Man, that's just do you hear how wrong that is? And so it's a glory to a church. Um, if, if we have to learn to have deference and, and defer to other people's, look, I'm not a country guy, I'm not a bluegrass guy, and yet there was a group Amen. that came and did some bluegrass worship I'm and so southern sorry. gospel with some knee slapping and stuff, and man, there were probably 50, 60 people in the room where they thought they were around the throne room in heaven and they were just worshiping, and I, at first I was like, uh, you know, and then I start looking and I'm like, whoa. I need to learn to worship like these people. And so um, I learned a lot from them. And then there are other styles too. And we're not going to, I'm not going to bring Bluegrass Morning back here because I can't do that. That's just not me. You're going to be stuck with my preferences for a while. And so please defer to me in that. But you know what? I do think that it's helpful if I can pull in other ensembles, other styles. We go back and we do some, what, some things that sound like stodgy hymns. I may not modernize all of them because uh, there's some, some, there's a, 100 or 200 years of history of churches worshiping that way that God was glorified with that I don't want to ignore. And uh, we, we actually grow when learning how to worship in other cultures. We love going to other countries and or other cultures even here when the nations come to us and hear other people sing the word of God in languages and in styles that I don't understand. And, and I kind of wish that we had more of that. So in that regard, we will try to vary instrumentation. Right now, I'm holding on for dear life and just learning how to, uh, you know, do what I know how to do. But, you know, I, I hope to grow and, and uh, be able to see what else this church, what other giftings this church, the Lord has given musically, and that we can incorporate those things. And so this is an open invitation. If you play an instrument that isn't currently up here, don't think, well, they don't do that here. Think, well, I need to talk to Chris, and we need to pray about whether the Lord could use that to glorify him. So if bagpipes, uh, hey, I have worshiped with bagpipes before. Now, I don't play it, but literally we pulled this guy in, and you know he only knew one song, but it was Amazing Grace, and that was a biblical <laughs> song, and we worshiped, and so, but. Okay, you just gave an open invitation for auditions. How does that work? Yeah, first come talk with me. Uh, I'm going to be far more interested in how you're doing with the Lord and how you're worshiping with your life before I, I know about your music. And so let's talk. We'll, do, we'll grab coffee. And, and um, not every season of life, just practically speaking, is good for everybody to be up here and, and committing time doing what they're doing. And so I want to I care for you in that way too. But then I would like to hear musically kind of where you're at and hear where you're going musically. And, and we can talk about that. But I, I told Smed, I'm, I'm, I'm praying for certain instruments that I haven't seen yet um, because they they can be a blessing in a church and I, I know how to do those things. And, and, the uh, kazoo? Not a kazoo. Um, I play a lot of instruments that I don't think are going to be a blessing here, but, um, but like, you know, uh, s strings, I don't do anything other than guitar right now. I, I wish I could play violin or cello or upright bass, but my point is, is that, uh, you know, the Lord gifts variety and and we want to lean into that when we can and um even if i don't know how to play those things i want to grow to learn to understand those musicians and learn how to utilize those better uh, i was blessed at the church we came from with someone who could use utilize any type of instrumentalist and he pulled whole choirs together and full orchestras and that's not my goal here it's not but um the variety of that really did bless the church in expressions that were surprisingly um impactful and biblical and, and it would be great if we could grow in that over the next 10 years or whatever. So. so Tom Blevins noticeably moved in his chair just now when you said choir. Yes. You want to speak to that? Um, look, I'm, I come from a background of loving choirs. I've never directed a choir, but I've been led by some incredible directors. And um, I, I like the idea. What's that? Maybe someday. Ma yeah, so maybe someday uh, we might start though um when i free some time up from tes some other things i'm going to start toying with some other things and probably some some smaller ensembles that might eventually get there uh so don't 
don't expect a, a, a Christmas choir or anything, but, um, but I do love vo the vocal um, contribution to church music and, and sacred music that I, I think should have an expression somewhere here eventually, so. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you were just dying to say in the last four minutes? Can people invite you over for dinner or invite themselves over for dinner at your house? Both has, have already happened, uh, and you guys are good at it, so thank you, and it's been sweet. Um, we were just over, it. Chris Allen just invited us over, and we just sat around and talked with people we had never spent time talking to, and I, and I got to say, this is like, we've been so busy trying to meet people. You guys notice the meeting conversations are different than hangout conversations? We, we got our, our kind of first real big, we just got to hang out and talk with people in the church, and it was very sweet, so thank you for all your graciousness, and we wouldn't turn it down if it kept coming and uh, if you invite yourself over we, we're actually uh, we've responded to that too and and we've uh, we've appreciated that yeah thank you guys so much